Hello and welcome to The Preserved Word. I am Pastor Brad and I uh, hope that you're having a, a wonderful week. I hope you had a good holiday, uh, July 4th holiday. Uh, that's when this was recorded. Anyway, I'm recording this on July 5th, all right, 2022. Uh, that's kind of important because what I have to bring to you today um, is, uh, is kind of timely in the sense that uh, one of my favorite teachers, Mike Winger, when I listen to, I, listen, I watch his YouTube channel, and I like him, and I encourage you to watch him. Uh, and even in spite of what I'm going to offer today, of course, um, and this is not a critique of him. This is, a, this is a critique of a philosophy that is affecting good biblical teachers, and I consider Mike Winger to be a good biblical teacher. Uh, to look, hey, What he does is he looks at what the Bible has to say about things except that he has a blind spot. And that is when it comes to versions of the Bible. And I've already gone over that before, but today, the reason why I want to bring this up is, um, let me pull up the video again. Um, it was episode 77. It's called, um, this is Mike Winger's channel, um, which uh, I believe the channel is called Biblical Thinking. Not, or maybe it's just called Mike Winger. That's all I'm seeing here. But the show is 20 Questions with Pastor Mike, episode 77. And it was released um, on Friday, uh, which would have been July 1st, I believe. Okay. Um, and in this episode, what he does is he takes, he goes live and he takes questions. The first one's not live and the rest, uh, he has it beforehand. And then as he's answering that one, he stacks them up and he's got so many listeners that he can get 20 pretty quick. And then he answers all those questions uh, from a biblical perspective. It's a great show. I think it was the very first question because it was at minute, it's at the third minute, 48 seconds, he gets a question and he goes to answer it with the most direct answer from the Bible, which is here. Uh, right there. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. <clears throat> then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then he stopped. And he said, there's some controversy about this passage. It may not be authentic. Some people say it was added later. So let's go to a different passage. You see, it's affecting our teaching. And the passage that he goes to is fine, and he, he ends up you know, giving a good biblical answer. But the best biblical answer was this one. And he didn't use it. It made him a weaker teacher. And not only that, it calls attention to in his, because a lot of people that listen to his show are not Christian. Or they're marginally, they're trying to figure it out. They're trying to get these questions answered. Um, and instead it calls attention to a problem, a controversy with the text that we base everything on that is completely unnecessary. This this is, this is only a controversy with the critical text. This, um, these modern critical texts, okay? So I, I wanted to stop and say, this is a pretty famous passage. When, when, when he stopped and said there was a controversy with this passage, I really, um, oops, you can't see. Oh, there we go. Uh, I really was like, really, that passage? I was shocked, that's what I'm trying to say. I was shocked. Uh, Father, forgive them for they do not for they know not what they do. Um, in the in the New American Standard, I looked it up in the New American Standard Bible, and it's still there. They still leave the passage there, but they put a, a footnote right here at the beginning of verse thirty four, uh, and this says the in you brackets. This first sentence is a later edition. That's what my footnote says. Uh, their footnote says. This passage was uh, this passage was not found in earliest manuscripts. Okay, that's just in the New American Standard. I don't know what other Bibles do. I didn't research what other Bibles did about this passage because I'm kind of over that. <laughs> what I wanted to see was this is a pretty famous passage. This is a remarkable statement by Jesus Christ on the cross. He is in severe agony. He has been betrayed. And what does he issue? He issues a plea for those that are hurting him. Now, my thought was, hey, if Jesus really said this, then 
I bet it's in the early church fathers. I bet people were quoting this way back in the day. Right? So let's go look at the early church fathers and let's see if the Bible that they had had this passage in it because I bet it's there. And what I would expect to find, spoiler alert, I've already looked, but even when I was going to look at it, I was, I'm expecting to find more than one reference because some of these passages that they leave out, you, you only find, you know, like you may only find one reference to in all the church fathers because they're, you know, their, their goal was not to recopy the Bible in their text. They're, copy, they're addressing issues within the church and so they quote the Bible with us. So it's just, you know, it's almost... It's not accidental, but it's you know it's almost accidental that they include the entire, almost the entire New Testament in their, in their early church writings. I think that was God again preserving His Word. But anyway, let's go look. So I thought this was a good opportunity to do something we haven't done in a while, and that show you how this works. Let me turn off this image right here. Get it out of the way. Let me shrink myself down so I'm not so much in the way now. Look, it's tiny me. All right. I go to this website. There's other websites that list these manuscripts. These uh, the early church writers. They wrote in Greek, especially the Anti Nicene. You'll find a lot of these wrote in Greek, but um, some of them wrote in Latin. And then uh, towards the end, uh, towards um, getting closer to 325, and also then later uh, the other church fathers. When you get these are mostly in Latin down here because just the world has switched over. But these are Greek, which is kind of cool, because then when they quote the Greek, they're speaking in Greek. So it's just this adds this level of trustworthiness. In addition, it's important, I always go to the anti nicene fathers. It's not anti, it's anti nicene fathers. It's my English, my uh, perfect English East Texas diction coming into play. Nevertheless, it means that they were before Nicene, the Council of Nicene, which took place in 325. So these are people who wrote prior to 325. That's important because when they reference these early manuscripts here, uh, well, this doesn't, this is the New King James, but when the New American Standard references these early manuscripts, they are after 325. They're about 340, okay, 335. That's the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, okay? Um, and, and some over, and so there's some what they call minuscules, which is like like little pieces, and they're all after most. I think they're all after. There may be a couple of minuscules before, but they're they're all after the bulk of them, especially the two major ones, which is the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, are after 325. So we can predate those manuscripts to see if that in in fact has been added, because if these church fathers are quoting these passages then the Bible they had, the manuscripts they had, contained these passages, and those passages were not added. Let me take this brief moment, before we go through this, let me take this brief moment real quick and ask and just kind of address this general philosophy. Hold on, let me get over here and make myself and blow up tiny me. Okay. We're not scribes. Me and you are not scribes, right? But... And we even do, people even do, and I'm in school too, but people do homework today very differently because we can cut and paste, we can do different things. But back in the day, when you were copying something out of a book and, and you were copying a quote, for instance, and you were copying out of this book and you were writing it down, which is more likely, that you're going to add something or that you're going to leave something out? Anybody who's ever done that knows you're, you're going to leave something out. You're way more likely to leave a phrase out or skip a line. You're way more likely to leave something out than to add something. You see, the philosophy that these people are putting forward, the crit not these people, the critical text scholars put forth is that things were added, that scribes added things in. They don't have any evidence of this. I'll go over the evidence they do have. And that... The, the burden of proof is on them because what we have, what we've always had as a church, should be what we trust the most unless they can prove otherwise. And I think they fail miserably in that proof. Now, next, you're, going to, you're copying something down. Are you going to skip something on purpose? Yeah, we use 
three little dots to, to do that, don't we? When we're copying something and we want to leave something out on purpose, we just we just need this piece and this piece. We don't need this. Maybe there's a parenthesis in the middle or maybe the person we're quoting is long-winded and he's referencing something previous. We just need these, these two pieces, this sentence and this sentence, and we're going to leave out the two or three sentences in the middle. We put a dot, dot, dot there to show that we've done that. Back then, when the Bible was being written, they didn't do that. They didn't, leave, they didn't put the dot, dot, dot in there. They expected you to know what they were quoting and expected you to know that there were passages left out in the middle. And a lot of times, they expected you to understand that they're referencing the whole passage, even though they're quoting the first and the last. Um, Jesus did this when he quoted passages you know, from the Old Testament. Many of the New Testament, uh, when they quote from the Old Testament, they'll take just pieces. Um, and there's no dot, dot, dot in the middle. They're expecting you to know that. They're expecting you to be smart enough to know that, to have a knowledge base of what they're quoting. All right. So you have that element. Now let's talk about the second piece of this. And that is this, mo the modern textual critics have this idea that they're pushing on us that not only were things added to the Bible over time, but second of all, that their scholarship this modern textual today, their scholarship is greater than the scholarship that existed when the uh, Texas Receptus was being put together, and especially when the uh, authorized version of the King James, what we call the King James version of the Bible, was being created, was being written, translated into English. I have found no evidence of this. In fact, I found the opposite to be true. And, and just read. Go read James White's King James, only, uh, King James Controversy. KJV Only Controversy, I think is the name of the book. Go read that book. It's a good book. Go read that book. He's a good scholar. At the same time you're reading that book, read Dean Burgeon's book, The Revision Revised, and see if you don't notice a difference in quality. A mastery of just the English language, not to mention a mastery of the Greek language that's behind it. When you read those two books, you're going, this seems like it's a high school book and this seems like it's a college book. I mean, you're just, you can just notice the difference in the scholarship, the reverence to the word, um, the quality of, of writing in general, and the intelligence. I'm not saying, you know, James White's way smarter than me. But when you compare those two men, you're like, yeah. <laughs> Dean Burgeon seems like he knows what he's talking about a lot more than this guy seems like. He's making a lot of assumptions in this book that Dean Burgeon isn't doing that. He's, he's reverencing every little thing and showing, improving every little claim uh, and doing so in a masterful way, putting it together to show uh, what he's trying to prove. And what, he, what Dean Burgeon is saying is you need to trust the received text. You need to trust the, the, the Bible we've always had, the preserved Word of God. I learned so much from trying to make, and it's not an easy book to read, but I learned so much from reading that book. Um, so that's two. Three. There's a third assumption, a third claim, which is almost an assumption. I think it is an assumption, but it's a third claim anyway. And that is that we have way more manuscripts today than they had when they put together the authorized version of the Bible. Therefore, we can make better decisions today. On the face of it, this seems to be true because of, our, because of all the archaeological digs that, that's been going on. But in reality, it's not true. It's not, it's not provable that we have... Now, here's the thing. Do we have more manuscripts today than they did then? If you include the minuscules, those little pieces of parchment that just contain like one line then you, you, you could say maybe, but do we have the amount of manuscripts, full-on manuscripts that they did when they put together the Textus Receptus, uh, when, uh, when uh, they did that, or when, or when in, in 1600, even when they were looking at the Textus Receptus and they were putting together the King James Version of the Bible. Let's, go, let's just go back to the, to the Textus Receptus. They're referencing manuscripts in the Texas Receptus that we do not have today. Good 
quality manuscripts that we don't have today. So you can't compare, and I don't remember the one. I should have got a couple examples in my head, but let's just say, let's just call it X. Well, they have manuscript X, and they're referencing it in, in the Texas Receptus. And today, we don't have that document anymore. We don't have that manuscript anymore. Instead, we have a little, you can't compare that manuscript with the little minuscule manuscript we have today. Because what they did was they, they scoured the earth, they searched the libraries of the earth, and they got the best ones. In fact, there is good proof to show that, uh, that he, uh, Erasmus, knew about Vaticanus and rejected it because of the poor quality of it. There's, there's evidence to show that he could have done that. It's not 100%, but it's, it's kind of alluded to. He, he did go there to the building where it was. Why would he have not looked at it? We know that he went there. He, he lived there for a little while and was studying the manuscripts while he was there. So, but he rejected it. He didn't use it because, of the poor, because it was poor. He had much better manuscripts. Why would he use it when he had better manuscripts that he was referencing, which we don't have today? And this claim that we have more manuscripts today than they had then is a little ridiculous when you consider that, and this is not King James only people saying this, this is just history. We lost hundreds and some say thousands of, of biblical manuscripts during World War II alone. Not to mention during the Crusades, and not to mention during the you know these uh, the time of uh, World War One and what happened you know or, and the different fires that have happened over the over the centuries. No, we don't have the same quality of manuscripts that they did in the 1500s. We just don't. Um, and no, not only that, but when you've got to think about the fact that for the first thousand years, when Jerome wrote his first Bible, the manuscripts that he had would have been much better, much richer, much earlier than the manuscripts that we have today. It's just arrogance. It, it, it lacks humility to think that we know better than they did then, or that what we have today is better than what they had then, or our philosophy today is better than their philosophy then. That's just arrogance. That our scholarship, that the scholars that are working on the NASB are somehow better than the scholars who were working on the King James. That's just not true. The scholars that were working on the King James spoke Greek fluently. They argued with each other about Greek issues in Greek. <laughs> Think about that. They, were, they could speak it, and they were arguing about it using the language. Our scholarship today is not that. The scholars that work on the Bible today are not that. And when we do consult the Greek scholars of today, uh, it was very interesting, one of the guys I watch, uh, what's his name, Ryan, oh, uh, remember now, I uh, forget his name now, Nick, this is Nick Sayers. Uh, he, wrote and re and he wrote to a Greek scholar who does speak Greek, and who is fluent in Greek. He's not a biblical scholar, so to speak. He's just a Greek scholar. And he asked him about 1 John 5, 7, because there's a Greek problem. There's a problem in the Greek grammar of 1 John 5, 7 if you leave out verse 7, if you leave out the, the, the comma. And uh, so he was asking about that. He goes, yeah. He said, this, this sentence makes no sense in Greek without that, without that passage. With the passage, it makes perfect sense. Without it, it makes no sense. It, it's, not, it's not a valid sentence. You've got to throw out the whole sentence, not just... If you're going to remove the, the comma, you, you, you got to take out the whole sentence because you're, you're talking gibberish now, which I think, uh, I think it, you know, that's, that's just interesting. It's just, it's just interesting to show the scholarship uh, and just this, the, the level of scholarship that existed when the King James was written, 47 scholars who spoke the languages, uh, who had better manuscripts, better quality manuscripts than we have today. Um, you just got to trust it. But that's not even where I'm going. That's not even, those three points don't even have anything to do with what I'm talking about now. Let's go to what I'm talking about now. Back to these church fathers. We're talking about this passage that we all know. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Jesus forgiving even the people who, pierced, who crucified him. Here we have... Uh, the Antinocene Fathers. If you go down here to the last volume in this set, it is an index. Okay. Oh, let me, can I, there we go. It's an index uh, of what is contained in all these volumes. And part of that index, let's just click on that. Okay. It gives you different ways to read it. I'm going to read it online in an HTML format. 
By the way, these this volume, this anti Nicene Fathers, volume 10, was written in 1885. Uh, published the first published in 1887, it says right here. But in the preface, it talks about 1885. But anyway, 1885 to 1887. So this had nothing to do with uh, any kind of controversy. These things aren't tainted by agenda. Okay, these are just the church fathers' writings. Okay, it's just sad that I have to reference that. All right, so I clicked on that little I there, which brings me this, um, which is important because I need the table of contents. TOC, table of contents. Now what I want to do is I want to go down here towards the bottom because that's where the index of scriptures are. There's different indexes listed here. Uh, there's an index of topics that the church fathers discussed. There's an index of just different things. But the index of text, this is an index of where they quoted the Bible, is down here towards the bottom. I think it starts around 200, 203, somewhere in there. Uh, but we're in the New Testament, which means it's going to be really down here towards the bottom. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, let's just click on 1, 245. Let's see where we're at. We're in Luke. Okay, that's where we're going. We're going to Luke. you got to know your Roman numerals for this, by the way. We're going to Luke 23. Uh, 10 is, 10 is, uh, X is 10. So I'm going to 20. So I want double X. And so I need to go further on. So I'm going to go, uh, let me just go to next, 246. Uh, here we go. Luke, no, that's 15. No, I'm still not there. Uh, this is 15. This says, if you know your Roman numerals, that's 10 plus 5 plus 3. So that's 10, 15, 18. Okay, so this is Luke chapter 18. Next. There we go. Now we're getting to double X's. So double X is 20. And there's 23. And there, verse 4. Through. Now remember back in the beginning of this video when I said, when I was shocked that this passage was controversial and because it's so famous and I thought, <clears throat> and so profound that Jesus would say this. And I said, look, if if you would think that the church that if Jesus really said this, it would be quoted a lot. Well, look, most of these have one reference, two references, you know, um, in here. See how the close together. Look at all the references here. There's a lot of references to this. The first reference is in volume one. Now, you, again, you kind of have to know how this is coded in. You got to learn this little code here. But this is Luke chapter 23, verse 34, volume I, which is volume one, um, page 54. Okay. This would be volume four. This would be volume. Uh, and I don't know why they're going to little. It's, these are Roman numerals as well, but they're little case instead of big case. And I, don't, I guess they're just doing that to show the difference. I don't know. But that's what that means. So we're going to look at volume one, page 54. So let's just do that. We're going to go back to the early church fathers because we're, now we're in the index. Let's go back here. Early church fathers. We're going to look at volume one. Okay. So we're going to click on volume one. And again, we have to go through here. And so we have to say, yes, how do I want to list? Do I want to listen to it, download it, read online? I do want to read online. Uh, oh, oh. Scroll down to the formats available right here. Read online. HTML means I want to see it in my, that just tells me I want to see it in my browser. Volume one, um, I'm going to click on this. And then I get, see, for some reason, this first page in volume one doesn't have the little I right there. I don't know if it's, I don't know why. But if I go to the next page, which is what that is, go to the next page, then I have the little Roman numeral there, which I can click on to get to my table of contents. Okay. So then I go to the table of contents. It's not the most, I mean, you can figure it out, but it, 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 you know, I don't know who put this together, but they were obviously a, a scholar because it makes no sense. Okay. Now, what page did it tell me to go to? I don't even remember. 54. All right. So let's go to page 54. And this is uh, Ig Ignatius. Uh, this is the epistle of Ignatius to the Ephesians. So this is a letter that Ignatius wrote to the Ephesians. We can go look at the preface to see when this was written, but I'll go ahead and tell you uh, that it was it was written at the uh, about 198. That's when Ignatius wrote. So um, 
obviously predating these other manuscripts. Go to all the way to the bottom and it lists all the little different footnotes and things. And right here we can see, right over here you see this, it says Luke 23 verse 34 is footnote 13. And then while we can go through here, there's footnote 17. So we go back up a little bit. Um, oh, there's footnote 14. So we know we're getting close. Uh, yep, there's footnote 13. And there's the passage, forgive, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. We can even read it so we know the context. Let us imitate the Lord who, when he was reviled, reviled not. And that's a reference too somewhere. There's a footnote on that. When he was crucified, he answered not. And when he suffered, he threatened not. That's another reference, uh, which might be interesting to look at. But prayed for his enemies, in quotes. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do, in quotes. There it is. So we know that Jesus said this. We know, we can know that within a hundred years, that whatever Bible Ignatius had, had this saying, this, this um, uh, verse in there, that Jesus had prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Um, and so we can trust that this passage is a saying of Christ, and that this passage belongs there. Now, he, now, what you won't have with the church fathers is the actual verse reference because those were added much later. So you're not going to have the church fathers saying, "Well, Luke thirteen thirty four, you know that that was twenty three. I'm sorry, twenty three thirty four. That's later on. Those get added. So he, they didn't have the convenience, so to speak, of uh, of saying something like that. Um. So. There you go. I don't know. I just didn't want you to be distracted by my sermon notes there for this Sunday. Um, anyway, we can trust the Bible. Bottom line, we can trust the preserved Word of God. We can trust God to preserve His Word. We don't have to turn to these scholars and start questioning, was that really a bad? Whenever, you're, whenever you read one of these footnotes and you say, oh, is that, I wonder if that passage is real. I wonder if that passage is authentic. I wonder if Jesus really said that then the devil is winning. And he, unfortunately, he's using men who care about, but who are misguided, who have been taken captive by a lie. I don't doubt the sincerity of the scholars. I don't doubt the, the, that, G, that, G, that, that James White is a, a saved individual, but the problem is he's being used. He is captive to a lie, and that lie is causing doubt in people. We... If you go look at this video, it caused doubt in Mike Winger, who's a good teacher. But it caused doubt in his mind about the Word of God. Don't doubt the Word of God. Don't let those doubts enter. Do the research. Do the hard work. I've shown you how to do it. If I can do it, you can. Just do a little research. If you, if you have a doubt, and put that doubt to rest. The preserved, God has preserved his word. He will preserve his word. It has not passed away. It will always be here. Base your Bible study on it and trust it. That's the key. Don't let these footnotes cause doubt in your mind. All right. I hope that this helps you. I hope this encourages you in your Bible study. I hope that uh, it strengthens uh, the word of God in your, in your mind and in your heart, which will only strengthen your faith in the Lord. Um, all right. I'll, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.